5. Proteus Jacques Cousteau, born in June 1910, was a French naval officer, filmmaker, oceanographer, and author. He co-invented the first successful open-circuit self-contained underwater breathing apparatus called the Aqualung, which he used in producing some of the world's first-ever underwater documentaries. And today, he's best known for bringing the oceans and all of their life into people's living rooms, where they could experience the mysteries of the deep sea firsthand. Jacques Cousteau passed away from a heart attack in June 1997, but his fascination with the ocean didn't die with him. His dreams of exploring the dark depths live on today through his grandson, Fabien Cousteau. In July of 2020, Fabian announced his plans to create what he described as an underwater version of the International Space Station, and he named this installation Proteus. Over 70% of the planet is covered in water, but despite this, only a handful of short-term research laboratories have been established underwater. There are a number of reasons for this, but the main one is that a person can only remain at such depths for a very short period of time. If you aren't familiar with diving, surviving at any serious depth requires you to breathe compressed air. The air is contained within big metal cylinders that you'll see most scuba divers wear on their backs. Our bodies react differently to compressed air than it does to the air we're used to breathing. Our bodies can still process the oxygen, but it's the nitrogen that causes issues over extended periods of time. The air you breathe in is made up of 78% nitrogen, 20 to 21 percent oxygen and about 1 to 2 percent of other gases and water vapor. But when this air is compressed, the nitrogen expands rapidly as the pressure on your body decreases. And if you ascend too quickly from deep depths, this nitrogen can potentially cause life-threatening issues, resulting in decompression sickness that's otherwise known as the bends. The longer you stay underwater, the slower you have to rise to the surface. Either that or you're forced to spend hours or even days in a decompression chamber. In short, every minute you spend on the seafloor requires a significant amount of decompression time, typically several times as many minutes. But Fabian has come up with a solution to this problem for researchers working at Proteus. According to him, staying on the seafloor and not having to return to the surface would significantly increase the amount of time spent continually on research and exploration. So, instead of undergoing a lengthy decompression after every dive, on top of the required safety time in between the dives, those returning from Proteus will only need a single decompression. Proteus is slated to be a 4,000-square-foot facility and will be four times bigger than any previous underwater station. And if all goes according to plan, researchers will be able to work, live, and eat at Proteus for multiple weeks at a time. The site will have sleeping quarters, research labs, a video production studio, and even a moon pool to allow workers to get in and out of the water with little effort. And surprisingly, Proteus will also have its own greenhouse, which will be the first of its kind in an underwater environment. Proteus will be built to support up to 12 scientists at any given time, and power will be provided to the station through a variety of sustainable sources, like solar, wind, and ocean thermal. Internet, power, and fresh air will also be provided by an umbilical cable that reaches the surface. At the moment, the plan is to construct Proteus off the coast of Curacao, an island in the Caribbean at a depth of about 60 feet. And while this project is being handled internationally, the main driving force behind it is Fabian Cousteau. Since, after all, it was Fabian and Fuse's project, his company, that designed the plans for the futuristic-looking station. It was initially slated to be finished by 2023, but COVID caused the project to have setbacks. And as of now, in mid-2023, construction on the underwater research facility has yet to begin. 4. Aquarius Reef Base NEMO is short for NASA Extreme Environment Mission Operations. It's an analog mission by NASA that sends groups of potential astronauts, scientists, and engineers to live in the Aquarius Underwater Laboratory for up to three weeks in preparation for space exploration in the future. And at the time it was installed, in 1986, Aquarius was the only undersea research station in the world. 
It's located about three and a half miles off the coast of Key Largo, Florida, specifically in the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary. Aquarius is situated 62 feet below the surface, next to deep coral reefs on the ocean floor. And today, it's one of just three undersea facilities on the planet dedicated to education and science. Aquarius is currently under the operational control of Florida International University FIU, but before 2013, it was owned by the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration and was operated by the University of North Carolina Wilmington. Then, in October 2014, FIU acquired full ownership of the underwater laboratory. The facility was designed by Perry Submarine Builders of Florida, and it was built by Victoria Machine Works in Victoria, Texas in 1986. The lab is often used by marine biologists who refer to Aquarius as their home base while they study the coral reef, aquatic plants, and the fish that live nearby. Aquarius has sophisticated computers and lab equipment, all of which enable scientists to process samples and perform research without having to leave the underwater facility. The laboratory accommodates two technicians and four scientists for missions that average 10 days. And those who work on the Aquarius are often referred to as aquanauts since they live underwater at depth pressure for 24 continuous hours or more without returning to the surface. A technique called saturation diving allows these aquanauts to work and live underwater for days or even weeks at a time. By using this approach, researchers remain submerged for at least 24 hours in order to allow their bodies to become saturated with dissolved gas. This allows divers to accurately predict how long they need to decompress before heading back up to the surface. In total, Aquarius has three compartments. Access to the water is made through the wet porch, which is a chamber with a moon pool. The moon pool keeps air pressure inside the wet porch, the exact same as the water pressure that exists at that depth through hydrostatic equilibrium. Like a submarine, the main compartment is strong enough to maintain normal atmospheric pressure, and the smallest compartment, called the entry lock, is located in between the other two, functioning as an airlock where Aquarius personnel wait while pressures tweaked to match either the main compartment or the wet porch. This amazing design allows aquanauts to return to the surface without even needing a decompression chamber. Since 2001, NASA has used Aquarius for a series of space exploration simulation missions. In the underwater environment, the aquanauts who are part of these missions perform extravehicular activities, or EVAs. The undersea world, much like space, is extremely hostile and is an alien place for humans to live. Nemo crew members go through some of the same challenges as astronauts would on a distant planet, moon, or asteroid. And during these Nemo missions, aquanauts are able to simulate the same conditions as they'd experience while living on a spacecraft. They can also test their spacewalking skills for future space missions. Do you think it's possible? that in the future we could have full cities that are self-sustainable underwater. Why or why not? Let us know your thoughts in the comments down below. And if you haven't already, be sure to subscribe to the channel. 3. Sub-Biosphere 2 London-based concept designer Phil Pawley unveiled his plans for a self-sustainable underwater habitat back in 1998. Pauli's proposed system was based on the Biosphere 2 project, which was a man-made closed ecological system in the U.S. state of Arizona. It was used by researchers to explore the prospects of sustainable living in a severely monitored environment. But unlike Biosphere 2, Pauli's sub-Biosphere 2, SBS2, would be fully submerged. Pauli's vision was focused on developing self-sustainable living conditions under the water. It would have had a central supporting biome that powered and controlled eight interactive living biomes, each of which would have represented a different ecosystem. And according to Pauli, all life support systems for water, food, air, and electricity would have been sustained through the innovative control of variant atmospheric pressures that typically occur in depth. And if this plan would have been brought to fruition, it would have acted as a seed bank, supporting the animal plant and human life in the biomes. 
The designs for this underwater habitat resemble what Atlantis may have looked like. With one central dome surrounded by eight living biomes, SBS-2 would have been able to float or submerge itself. Against the forces of air, the pressure and depth would have acted like a heart and lungs, sustaining the living organisms within the biomes. And the central support biome would have monitored the life systems from within its operations facility. Unfortunately, though, SBS-2 was never built. Pauli didn't receive enough investment to bring his dreams into reality. However, his plans for the underwater habitat remained to inspire others with similar goals in mind. But maybe, just maybe, Sub-Biosphere 2, or a base like it, will be built in the future, when we may have no other choice but to live underwater. 2. Sea Orbiter The Sea Orbiter is a proposed ocean-going research vessel that was due to start back in 2014. However, only the eye of the vertical ship was completed by May of 2015, and as of early 2021, there's been no news of any other construction on the Sea Orbiter being done. The designs for this marine vessel resemble what looks like a futuristic floating hotel, and once completed, the Sea Orbiter will be the world's first vertical ship. It'll stand at an impressive 170 feet tall, but in order for the ship to stay stable, two-thirds of it will remain underwater, giving it buoyancy to stay afloat. The vessel will also have a fish collection system, so researchers can study the pelagic ecosystem, fish stocks, and plankton biodiversity. The $52.7 million project has been in the works for quite some time, but many write it off as nothing but a pipe dream. The Sea Orbiter is well behind schedule in its construction, but the project headed by the Floating Oceanographic Laboratory Organization still seems to be underway. Those involved in the project, however, are keeping tight-lipped about the progress being made on the vertical ship. 1. Nemo's Garden Nemo's Garden is something entirely different from NASA's Nemo missions. Instead of a project aimed at preparing astronauts for space, Nemo's Garden is the first underwater cultivation system of terrestrial plants in the world. It's situated off the coast of Noli, Italy, near Genoa, and the farm consists of a variety of transparent, suspended, dome-shaped greenhouses that are called biospheres. And these so-called biospheres are anchored to the sea floor to keep them in place. Started by an Italian family in the diving equipment business, their goal for Nemo's garden is to change agriculture. As we know, it's difficult to grow enough food to sustain every person on the planet. But this new technology gives added possibilities for growing produce on the coastlines of Earth. This underwater garden is completely sustainable and doesn't negatively affect the environment in any way, according to Luca Gambarini, who co-founded the project. Luca's father and founder of Ocean Reef Group, Sergio Gambarini, came up with the idea for Nemo's garden by combining two of his passions, gardening and scuba diving. The project began in 2012, when he and his family went about planting basil in a balloon submerged underwater. And now, more than 10 years later, the aquatic garden is absolutely thriving. Separated from any pathogens and pests, the plants in Nemo's garden float 20 to 33 feet below the surface, but they still have access to fresh water due to desalinated condensation that forms within the biospheres. And according to Sergio, the somewhat steady temperature of the seawater makes for an ideal environment for plant life. Hydroponics, a technique that utilizes water-based nutrients instead of regular soil, is used in Nemo's garden, the same method that's used in most, if not all, indoor vertical farms. And although the plants are situated fairly deep in the water, sunlight still reaches them. Everything that happens in the biospheres is monitored on dry land through sensors and cameras, and settings can even be adjusted remotely from anywhere on the planet. And when it's time to harvest, a diver employed by Nemo's garden will clip the vegetation before placing it in bags to float it back up to the surface. The biospheres are too small to grow larger crops like wheat or corn, but they're just big enough to fit between 70 and 100 smaller plants. 
Amazingly, in a 2020 study conducted by the Universidad de Pisa, the basil grown in this underwater environment proved to contain more antioxidants and a higher concentration of essential oils than those grown on land. And other studies done at Nemo's garden showed that the aquatic farm attracts sea life. Sergio told CNN in 2023 that compared to the surrounding environment, 58% more fish prefer to live near the aquatic farms. So, according to Sergio, it has a repopulation effect. And while it may seem strange to grow food underwater, it may be the way of the future. Would you ever volunteer to live underwater in one of these amazing research stations? Let us know in the comments down below. And if you like this video, be sure to give it a thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe to the channel. Thanks so much for watching and we'll see you in the next one. Bye.